Okay, so the mold in your coffee, it's obviously gross, but is it really something that we need to be concerned about? Does it actually harm our health, our wellness goals, our weight loss goals? I'm going to be diving into all of those details in today's video. All right guys, if you're new to my channel and you don't know who I am, my name's Autumn and I'm a certified clinical nutritionist with my master's nutrition human performance. On my channel, I'm typically talking about the science-backed and holistic methods that you can use in order to achieve your wellness dreams. So if you have a wellness goal in mind, make sure you subscribe. Okay, so for this one, I wanted to bring on a really great expert in the field of mold and coffee. And so I interviewed Andrew, who is the creator and the founder of Purity Coffee. It's my favorite go-to organic mold-free coffee. You guys see me talk about it all the time. I'm a little bit obsessed with it. I've personally seen so many great benefits when I switched over to a mold-free coffee, but I've been getting a lot of questions about if mold in your coffee really is that detrimental, if it's worth actually looking for a brand that doesn't have mold in it or the mold toxins that go along with it. So I went ahead and I interviewed Andrew for you guys in order to get the science behind this and see whether or not it is that having mold in your coffee really matters, especially when it comes to your wellness goals. Yeah, my name is Andrew Salisbury and I'm the founder of Purity Coffee. With mold, <laughs> I always I always talk to my audience about, other than the fact that that should just gross you out, that there's mold or mold toxins in coffee, there's actually a lot of reasons health-wise and for your wellness goals why you wouldn't want mold and mold toxins in your coffee, but what's like the cliff notes of why you don't want mold or mold toxins in your coffee? Well, the, the, the first thing is the distinction between mold and mycotoxins. So, so mold obviously, as you know, exists around the world. And if you, you know, you go outside, you're going to be exposed to a certain amount of mold toxins. But the problem with coffee is that in the process of farming and processing coffee, there's a lot of risk of higher exposure of mold. And when you get mold in the coffee in the first place, it's just very difficult to eradicate it because it can turn into mycotoxins. So basically the mold, um, metabolizes into mycotoxins and mycotoxins are things like ocrotoxin A and aflatoxin that once they've developed in the coffee you can't roast them out so a lot of roasters will say yeah you know it's just it's not an issue there's not mold in coffee and they would be right in saying that there's not mold in coffee in the roasted stage but there is mycotoxins in coffee because mold has developed in the earlier stage of coffee and mycotoxins are the things you really have to worry about. And when most people talk about mold toxicity, they're talking about uh, that. All right, guys, I just want to jump in for a little clarification here because I know that there was a lot of science that was just said, but it's really important to understand. So what Andrew is saying is that, yes, there can be mold on coffee and mold is essentially the living creature that's uh, going to be on your coffee, but the mold toxins are what are produced by the mold. And when you go through the roasting process, that will kill off the mold because the mold is living, but that does not mean that the mold toxins are gone. In microbiology, this is a really big thing that we learn about is that you can't necessarily cook off the toxin that is produced by a mold or a bacteria. And this is what Andrew's explaining right here is that yeah, a coffee can say that it's mold free, but it doesn't mean that it's mold toxin free. And that's what's really important. And that's what can have the biggest negative health effects for us. What I'm curious about if this is true or not, because I read this somewhere. <laughs> um, I read that in the US that we don't really have a threshold um, for, uh, I believe you said is ochre toxin A, right? Um, yeah for our coffees, but in other countries, they actually do have some type of threshold that uh, you have to keep it under a certain minimum amount that those companies will then dump their ochre toxin A filled coffees into yep. the US in order to get a profit. Is that true? <laughs> You have standards, but they're low standards. Right. Uh, so that's the problem. And, and in Europe, there are a lot higher standards and same thing with Asia. And so the problem is, if you're producing in a farm in Brazil, if you think you've got a problem in terms of mold with your coffee, you're more likely to send it to the US and give them a better price than you are if you're gonna send it to Europe and have that container shipped back. So yeah, that's the problem. How is it that the EU and other countries actually know to at least have some standard for this but we don't it's just my my opinion not as an expert but i mean just the standards in the u.s especially when it comes to things like pesticides and herbicides that are used and gmo i mean the standards are more lax i mean there's more of an experiment going on with the food that you're eating in the u.s than there is in uh, the food that they're eating in europe the standards are a lot higher i mean they 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 they're more concerned about gmo they're more concerned about pesticides like uh, endosulfin and glyphosate and if consumers are not saying 
trend they want a higher quality coffee if, if you're not as a consumer asking your coffee company i want to see your mold tests i want to see your pesticide residue tests and it's not affecting their sales well that's yeah then why go through good. that extra level of effort and cost yeah. that's yeah. right so what is it that like if someone thinks that they might have a more sensitivity to mold, like I know I do. I was exposed to black mold when I was younger and I was really sick for three weeks. I think that's why I'm especially affected. But what is it that people would, you know, what's been studied to see as a um, negative effect of these mold toxin exposures? I think they're starting to realize there's more and more of an impact from mold than we first originally realized. And as you know, with black mold, I mean, a lot of times people used to think that, oh, that's no big deal, that they would just see black mold on a wall and they would ignore it. And people are realizing there's just a lot of illnesses that are, that, that are related to that. Ocrotoxin A is very bad for the kidneys. Um, it's a, it's, it's, there's, there's a, there's a knock on effect all over the body. It's pretty systemic, but it's, um, but in particular for the kidneys. And the real problem with Ocrotoxin a is the only way you can roast it away in the roast is to do it at such high temperatures for a long period of time that you're getting a very dark roast which is uh, basically roasting away all of the antioxidants and it's creating a thing called PA, PAH polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons which you get from any burnt food and so you're, you're sort of the problem is if the mold develops in the first place and it turns into ocrotoxin A which is the biggest um, biggest risk it's just very difficult to get rid of. I mean because again I know for me I've found that it really resonates with anxiety I've, I've read a few studies on how they're finding associations not necessarily cause and effect yet that there's just not the research I think yet for that but there's a lot of people actually coming out and saying like this is what's happened to me when I know that I've been exposed to mold and when I'm not our experience has been anecdotally from our customers that people who couldn't drink coffee before can now drink our coffee. But we don't really know if it's just the mold because we made every decision based on health and there's probably you know, 13, 14 different decisions along the way. And it, uh, we found that if we make every decision based on health, then people's sensitivities drop away to coffee. And um, so I think you, I think that the, the the real answer to this is you you really have to trust your body you have to um you have to see how your body's reacting to your particular coffee and um and then try a mold-free coffee i mean as yeah. a minimum mold-free and organic are probably the two very basic starting points because of the the, the amount of pesticides that are used on coffee when you say the most basic starting points because i've read through the literature you guys have sent me on the additional <laughs> yeah. levels you guys go through but what would that next level be that maybe the public doesn't know about Okay, so starting point, um, organic, it needs to be mold free, you should ask your coffee company for tests that it is mold free, and they should have that on hand. I mean, they, they absolutely should. And the more people who ask for it, the, the, the more likely that they're going to test their coffee for mold and improves the system. Okay. The second things after that, that most people are not aware of is your coffee needs to be specially grade and especially grade is the highest grade of coffee. So you would think, well, you know, what's that got to do with health? Is it just taste? But the way specialty grade works with the Specialty Coffee Association is every defect in coffee takes away points from a coffee being specialty grade. And every defect actually has health risk linked to it. So there's things like one defect could be chipped or broken beans. If the way that the coffee is manufactured has a lot of chips and broken beans, what that does is that creates a, a different heat of the beans in the roasting. So you imagine if you're roasting coffee and you've got a full bean um, and you roast a coffee which is a broken and chipped bean, that one is much more likely to char and that's going to create PAHs. All right, I'm jumping in again here just for a quick analogy. So the way that I understood this when Andrew's explaining it, it's kind of like if you are cooking and you're cooking sweet potato fries and you cook some that are, you know, big shape, you cook a whole sweet potato, and then you have some that are pieces of sweet potato. The ones that are the small pieces of sweet potato are going to get burnt before the full sweet potato will actually get cooked. So this is why the specialty grade is so important so that they're all the, the right size so that they don't have the different charring points that will cause more of those PAHs that he discussed earlier to be formed. And then you want it roasted, and this is the, this is the trick. You won't find this anywhere else, but you really want a coffee that's roasted to maximize antioxidants. Um, so the first step is 
the amount of antioxidants in your coffee vary from crop to crop and harvest to harvest. So it's not like a uniform starting point for all coffee and then you roast it to increase or maintain the antioxidants. You have to get a coffee in the first place that's very high in antioxidants. So we lab test about 40 to 50 organic coffees from around the world and pick the three or four that are highest in antioxidants. And then we roast it to a sweet, spot, sweet point, which has low acrylamide, no PAHs and high antioxidants in the coffee. For each batch, you guys have a different roasting level because each batch is different. And so you need to find that balance for each batch. Yeah, I mean, so we lab test, I mean, it's a, a huge amount of our sort of our cost of operation is lab testing the coffee because there's just no way of doing this um, without lab testing it. I mean, we've, we've noticed a few things. Having said that, we've noticed a few things which are interesting over over the years. We initially would lab test coffee from all over the world, wherever we could find it, as long as it was organic and specialty grade. And then we would pick the ones highest in antioxidants. But what we've started to discover in the last couple of years is the ones that are highest in antioxidants are the ones that have been farmed with regenerative farming, mm -hmm. where you've got great topsoil, where you've got, it, you know, we look for certain monikers like bird friendly, shade grown, that sort of right. thing, Smithsonian certified, because that all indicates that the coffee was grown very close to nature. It was hand picked, it was hand selected. And because of that, that we've actually found it's very high in antioxidants as a starting point. That makes so much, I didn't know that about Purity, that you guys look for the regenerative farming. Um, that's something that I have, I mean, I think in a different life, I was a farmer because that's <laughs> something I love researching is the farming aspect and regenerative farming. When I was studying abroad in Italy, we went to um, a regenerative farm. I think they called it a biodynamic farm perhaps, um, but where like the chickens were interdispersed with the cows and there yeah. weren't crop lines. It, everything was sort of growing together so that the chickens would um, pick through the cow poo and pick out the parasites and and trample in the um, the fertile uh, cow poo. <laughs> yeah. And how it all just sort of mixes together and makes it so, such a healthy ecosystem. That makes so much sense. I would have so much more antioxidants, just like with humans, when you give us the right types of foods and we can perform our best. And same thing with the plants too. All right, guys, I talked with Andrew and just for the AM peeps until July 13th, he's going to be providing 20% off of the Purity products if you use the code SUMMERIF at checkout. So I'll have the details down in the description below so you can get your mold-free coffee, the one that I personally drink every day. Otherwise, if you want to see my interview with Andrew on coffee and weight loss, I highly recommend you check out this video right here. Also, also, if you're new to my channel and you love the science backed information, make sure you subscribe right here. Come out with new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in, and I'll see you in my next video.